It's a pleasure to be with you. The title of this talk is Management and Public Health Leadership Introduction. There are no disclosures for this presentation. Much of the material from these sessions on management and public health leadership comes from the book, Essentials of Management and Leadership in Public Health by Robert Burke and Leonard Friedman. This book was published in 2011 by Jones and Bartlett. This would be an excellent book for any public health library. Objectives include review the definition of public health management, discuss the four management elements, emphasize the importance of organizational values and how leaders can influence those values. Introduce the six management functions. Briefly review adaptive and technical leadership. Discuss the skills, competencies, and roles of managers. Discuss the attributes associated with senior managers and leaders. And review the four management styles and the contingency theory. In these sessions on management and public health leadership, the terms leader and senior level manager are interchangeable, since in practice, senior level managers are commonly not only managers, but also leaders of the public health enterprise. Leadership creates vision. Management makes it happen. Public health management utilizes multidisciplinary skills to effectively operate public health programs including skills from sociology, psychology, behavioral sciences, economics, management theory, statistics, and finance. Management competencies and skills empower leaders to achieve the goals of public health. Good management is necessary to accomplish the following. Effective epidemiology, protect the environment, design, implement, and evaluate health education programs, develop better and more comprehensive health promotion and health awareness programs, and adequately advocate on public health issues, etc. Without good management, public health programs and agencies would flounder. There are many misconceptions about management. Some public health students feel that management is only useful for increasing corporate productivity and profit and provides no benefit for public health programs, the public or public health professionals, and may even be considered an unnecessary part of agency bureaucracy, an unwanted obstruction to doing good for the population. In other words, we don't need management, just get out of our way. I experienced the result of that misconception during the Rwanda genocide and crisis. For several weeks, I helped with the response at the Ngara camp in Tanzania, where we were receiving hundreds of people an hour, eventually growing to a camp of 100,000 people. Well-meaning organizations and workers arrived and wanted to do good work, not constrained by the oversight or management of the United Nations High Commissioner of Relief. This resulted in confusion, misuse of valuable resources, inadequate care of these vulnerable people, and the eventual failure of many of these smaller camps, all due to well-intentioned groups that knew little or nothing about disaster management and incident command. The same is true here in the United States. Without appropriate management, little would be accomplished to meet public health needs of the population. Public health management is meant to be a tool to help all of us in public health do our work more effectively and efficiently. A generic definition of management is the process of dealing with or controlling things or people. That process can be a varying quality underlining the need for public health leaders 
to be adequately trained in good management skills and competencies. Good public health management could then be further defined as an interdisciplinary set of skills and competencies, an integral part of the public health enterprise, ensuring that the goals of public health programs are met. The 10 essential public health services are assessment that includes one, monitor health status to identify community health problems, two, diagnose and investigate health problems and health hazards in the community. Policy development includes three, inform, educate, and empower people about health issues, four, mobilize community partnerships to identify and solve health problems. Five, develop policies and plans that support individual and community health efforts. Assurance includes six, enforce laws and regulations that protect health and ensure safety. Seven, link people to needed personal health services and ensure the provision of health care when otherwise unavailable. Eight, ensure a competent public health and personal health care workforce. Nine, evaluate effectiveness, accessibility, and quality of personal and population-based health services. 10, develop new insights and innovative solutions to health problems. The diagram demonstrates that systems management is necessary for the appropriate implementation of each of those 10 essential public health services, including appropriately managing the research that provides best and promising practices for the whole enterprise of public health. The study of public health management can be divided into three parts, including one, basic management theory, two, technology, including finance, economics, and information systems, and three, advanced management skills. This slide lists the four basic management elements, including one, practice technical and human relations skills and competencies that support the organization's vision and mission, two, develop objectives for the organization that will accomplish the mission. Three, appropriately identify, obtain, and use resources to accomplish organizational objectives. And four, develop and oversee an appropriate formal organizational structure that supports the vision and mission of the organization. Let's spend a few minutes talking about organizational values, since they're intimately associated with employee enthusiasm for the organization and overall organizational effectiveness. Like communities, organizations have cultures. Much has been written about organizational culture and how it influences organizational effectiveness. This diagram is an adaptation of G. Linwood Barney's Layers of Culture. The beliefs of the organization lie at the heart or center of the culture. Those beliefs are aggregated and result in an organizational philosophy. The organizational philosophy influences the organization's values. The beliefs, organizational philosophy, and values result in how the organization runs itself, also known as the organization's institutions. Those deeper layers then finally result in the organization's behaviors and actions. An organization's values also define the ethics of the organization, as noted in the diagram. All cultures need to change something for their survival and health, including organizational cultures. Leaders need to understand the values of their organization 
since those values are linked with the organization's effectiveness. Ethics audits are an important tool for managers to assess the values of an organization. Ethics audits commonly include staff cultural surveys, observations of staff staff and staff customer interactions, review of employee recruitment, selection and training, and customer satisfaction survey data. Ethics audits provide a leader with insights into the values of the organization and which values may need to be changed to accomplish the vision and mission. So how does a leader change an organization's values? A leader must understand that attempting a cultural change will often create conflict, and he or she must be willing to endure that conflict. This slide is adapted from Charles Kraft's Recommendations for Changing a Culture. Number one, understand what part of culture needs to be changed, like the values just mentioned. It's important to know not only that the values need to be changed, but also which value needs to be changed. Two, encourage a change in beliefs that support those values by casting an inspiring and motivating vision. Casting an inspiring and motivating vision is a major role for the leader and other senior managers. All senior management must be on the same page and support that vision. There are many styles of managing. Realize that a style that's successful in one organization may not work in another. One size will not fit all situations. This slide demonstrates two of the more polar styles and how these approaches impact organizational commitment to values and resultant organizational effectiveness. Other styles will be discussed later. Some experts advise that senior management not only cast a vision, but also develop the organizational strategy, including all the steps to defining goals and objectives. In that scenario, the role of the rest of the organization is to operationalize the goals and objectives developed by senior management. As might be expected, this authoritarian style commonly results in less commitment to organizational values since they essentially reflect senior management's values not necessarily the rest of the organization's employees or members. This approach may result in less organizational effectiveness, since employees may not be deeply committed to the senior leadership's set of values. A polar approach is the democratic style, where senior management casts an inspiring and motivating vision, and the rest of the organization through a participatory strategic planning process, develops a strategic plan that reflects the values of the whole organization. In the democratic approach, senior management influences organizational values by casting an inspiring vision that influences the beliefs and values of organizational members. This approach will not be effective if the leader and other senior managers cannot cast a compelling vision, don't personally believe in that vision, or fail to lead by example. The democratic approach requires patience and continual restatement of the vision as the organization develops a value set supporting the vision. My personal preference is the democratic style to enhance organizational commitment. Kraft's third recommendation for changing a culture is to work with mid-level managers, informal leaders, and employees, utilizing community engagement techniques to foster ownership of the cultural change. The leader's role in community engagement is to facilitate a community engagement process, not dictate a cultural change 
which rarely, if ever, works to foster ownership. To foster ownership of these changes, participatory teaching techniques are extremely helpful. The technique I've used extensively is LEPSIS. The acronym stands for Learner-Centered, Problem-Posing, Self-Discovery, Action-Oriented, and Spiritually Sensitive. LEPSIS will be covered in other sessions of the North Dakota Public Health Training Network. Be sure to include both formal and informal leaders as you move forward. All leaders, formal and informal, need to be supportive of these changes. If not, they can undermine the whole process. Informal leaders are also known as opinion leaders, horizontal communicators, influential individuals in class, and champions. Informal leaders are key to changing the beliefs and values in any organization or community. Four, cultural change requires patience to move at the pace of the community, not necessarily the pace desired by leadership. Five, leadership must model the behaviors that reflect changed values. There are five main management functions, planning, organizing, controlling, directing, and staffing. The leader or manager in each of these functions needs to problem solve and make decisions. Almost everything a manager does falls into one or more of these functions. Managers must be adept at all five of these functions. A quote from the book Essentials of Management and Leadership in Public Health affirms that by stating, concentrating on a few of these functions to the exclusion or diminution of the others will invariably cause problems for the organization. Further discussion of these functions will be covered in other talks of the North Dakota Public Health Training Network. According to Linsky and Heifetz's book, Leadership on the Line, utilized at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, leadership skills and their problems can be divided into two broad categories. Technical or management, also described as caretaking of an organization, maintaining the status quo, and transactional, and adaptive, also described as extreme and radical, by Steve Farber in his book, The Radical Leap. Other adaptive attribute adjectives include visionary, dynamic, and transformational. Both technical or management and adaptive or extreme skills are needed for public health leaders to adequately run their organizations. Knowing the difference and when to appropriately use each set of skills is extremely important. This slide lists some key attributes of technical leadership management. Management problems and their solutions are fairly obvious, with the fix requiring minor adjustments. No major changes in the way things are done. In these situations, leadership can orchestrate the fix. They can manage it. These solutions are generally transactional. There is little risk for the manager in technical situations. The checkers are all on the board. They just need to be rearranged a bit. That's not the case with adaptive, extreme, or radical leadership. Adaptive problems are often seen in times of crisis. The solution to adaptive problems is not readily apparent. Adaptive situations and solutions need new approaches and major changes in the way an organization functions, commonly resulting in organizational resistance to those changes. There are many unknowns in adaptive situations, therefore carrying more risk for the leader. A leader senior manager can throw all the technical management fixes they can generate at the problem, and it still persists. 
Adaptive problems require a group process to find an effective transformative solution. So the role of the leader in an adaptive situation is not to line up the checkers. The leader must facilitate the group to find the checkers. The adaptive leader must also cast an inspiring vision for the group, mobilizing and encouraging them to seek an adaptive solution. This is actually true community engagement. Facilitating groups and communities to own their adaptive problems and solutions. Adaptive leadership is also defined as extreme or radical leadership. I want to re-emphasize that effective leaders need both sets of skills and competencies, technical management skills and adaptive extreme group facilitation skills. According to Linsky and Heifetz in Leadership on the Line, the single most common source of leadership failure we've been able to identify in politics, community life, business, or the nonprofit sector is that people, especially those in positions of authority, treat adaptive challenges like technical problems. In other words, they try to manage their way out of situations that require group process. Understanding the difference between technical and adaptive skills and when to use them is critical for effective leaders of any organization. For the next few slides, we'll consider some different ways of looking at what managing does. Let's start with some definitions. Skill is a proficiency, facility, or dexterity acquired or developed through training or experience. Competency is the ability to meet complex demands of a situation by drawing on and mobilizing various skills and attitudes. Competency is the ability to apply skills based on situational needs. Role is the part played by a person in a given situation. Some managing texts mention three sets of management skills to achieve organizational objectives, including one, technical, two, conceptual, and three, interpersonal or human relations skills. This diagram illustrates the different proportions of skill usage based on a manager's position in the organization. A senior level manager makes greater use of conceptual skills versus technical and interpersonal skills, where middle level and first level managers use more technical and interpersonal skills versus conceptual ones. This table is not exhaustive, but gives some ideas of what technical, conceptual, and interpersonal skills mean. Technical skills relate to things like preparing a budget, planning a new process, reorganizing a work group, etc. Conceptual skills would include perceiving how various factors fit together and interact, or understand the second and third order consequences of decisions and non-decisions, etc. Interpersonal skills would include knowing how to collaborate, cooperate, and work with people and different groups, understanding how others think and act, cross-cultural concepts, and how to motivate employees or members of the organization, etc. Another way of looking at managing is considering a list of management competencies the ability to apply skills as appropriate to a given situation. That list includes the same skill terms previously mentioned, conceptual, technical, and interpersonal collaborative, along with political, commercial, and governance competencies. Middle and entry-level managers 
use conceptual competence to understand how their work applies to the organization as a whole. Senior managers use conceptual competence to predict and respond to consequences of decisions and non-decisions. Upper level managers and leaders should be able to adequately perceive situations and apply appropriate responses and actions in a timely manner. Technical, managerial, and clinical competence relates to understanding and applying the basics of specialized activities as it relates to the organization. An example of this would be the technical knowledge of measles disease and MMR vaccines in dealing with a measles epidemic. Technical competence also helps managers more effectively direct the work in their jurisdiction. Interpersonal collaborative competence enables a manager to instill vision and inspire and stimulate others to work toward that vision and accomplish organizational objectives. Political competence provides an understanding of how to work with local, state, and federal governments to influence the legislative and rulemaking process. Commercial competence relates to applying appropriate business skills and techniques to a public health setting. Governance competence is different from political competence. Governance competence is the ability to apply rules, norms, and actions to the organization so it is adequately structured, sustained, regulated, and held accountable, both internally and with external partners, which could include a health department's governing board, the legislative body, or other agencies and organizations. Once again, all of these competencies are associated with the appropriate application of skills in a given situation. Let's consider a manager's roles or the part they play in various situations. One set of roles is interpersonal as the organization's figurehead, leader, and liaison. Other roles include informational as a monitor, disseminator, and spokesperson, decisional as an entrepreneur, resource allocator, and negotiator, designer as an organizer, and strategist as a planner. Managers must have a variety of skills, competencies, and roles to be effective. So let's consider the attributes of a senior level manager or leader versus middle or entry level managers. The following phrases have been used to describe senior management or leaders. The art of mobilizing others to struggle for shared aspirations. Sticking your neck out or taking risks when it's the right thing to do. Living dangerously often exceeding authority, withstanding criticism, is usually lonely, and successfully resolves problems. I've also included Steve Farber's definition of leadership, who uses the acronym LEAP, including love, edge or energy, audacity, and proof. These are attributes of senior level managers or leaders. Common attributes of senior managers or leaders include casting vision that influence the values of an organization, being able to anticipate an opportunity or problem, having a situational perception and knowing what actions and skills need to be applied at an appropriate time as previously mentioned. Other attributes include power, charisma, intelligence, and someone who people follow or someone who guides and directs others. Senior level managers and leaders possess the advanced conceptual skills and competencies we previously discussed. A senior level manager and leader has the competence of casting vision. De Bono et al 
in a book titled Moments in Leadership, stated that leadership qualities begin with a unique vision. Steve Farber, in his book, The Radical Leap, said, A vision statement doesn't generate energy. Love does. Great ideas do. Principles and values do. But vision from the heart is, by definition, an expression of love. And not only is it more energizing, it is energy. The vision needs to come from your heart. It needs to say, this is who I am. This is what I believe. This is what I think we can do together if we put our hearts into it. If you can do that, you don't need a document with a printed vision statement because you've become a living, breathing vision. You must deeply believe in the vision of an organization or you can't put your heart into it. If you can't do that, move on, or you surely can't cast a vision for others. You won't inspire employees and they for sure won't want to follow you, and you shouldn't be leading that organization. Move on to a place where you can passionately lead. Let's revisit leadership styles for a few minutes. Rensis Likert described a leadership continuum from autocratic to benevolent, consultative, and participative or democratic. An autocratic leader has complete authority and the followers obey the instructions of the leader without questioning. Benevolent leadership creates observable benefits, actions, or results for the common good. Benevolent leaders may be autocratic, consultative, or democratic as well. Consultative leaders attempt to involve people who have problems in seeking ideas for a solution. Team building is a prime target of consultative leadership. Participative or democratic leaders pursue decisions through a shared process where the views of a team or group are valued and contribute to the vision, goals, and decisions that are made. Some management experts add that leaders may use these different styles based on the management situation, called the contingency or situational theory. Sometimes an authoritarian approach may be most effective, whereas in other situations, the benevolent, consultative, or democratic styles would be most appropriate. In summary, leadership creates vision and management makes it happen. Organizational commitment to vision is essential for organizational effectiveness. Casting a vision is key for the development and support of an organization's values. Public health leaders and managers need both technical and adaptive leadership skills and competencies. Senior management and leadership manifest advanced conceptual skills. Effective leadership and management styles are contingent on a management situation. Take your public health practice skills to the next level. Our specialized certificate courses give you an opportunity to work systematically through a public health topic and demonstrate your understanding of that material in a capstone project. Learn more and sign up at ndphtn.com certificates.